So your warm-up today is a very nice segue into today's lesson. Sometimes it's a review kind of warm-up. Today, it's kind of a looking forward warm-up. So if you kind of remember your uh, geometry knowledge, something like this is pretty easy. Bless you, right? We mentioned Sokoto yesterday, right? This is a way to remember how to set up your sine, cosine, and tangent ratio in terms of opposite adjacent hypotenuse. Good. Uh, so we have this triangle given. Uh, we got vertices A, B, and C. Now in geometry, there was a difference between the name of the angle and the measure of the angle, right? Two angles are congruent if their measurements are equal. We don't really make a distinction between the two in pre-cal. So if I label it A, B, C, A is not only the location or the name of the right angle, it's also then the measure of that angle. We would say A equals 90 degrees, okay? So we're kind of past that subtle distinction here. Um, but we've got two non-right angles, B and C. And so when you use your trig uh, functions, which is what these are called, you, you're going to refer to either one of the two uh, non-right angles, B or C. And I gave you units here, uh, 6, 10, and 8. And so now I'm trying to find the sine of C. So if you come over here to sine, uh, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So that would be what? Well, you got to find the angle C first, because remember, the opposite and the adjacent will switch depending on which angle you're referring to. So for C, the opposite is 6 inches. Um, and, of course, the hypotenuse is 10 inches. Now, a word about the units, first of all. What happens with the units here? They divide out. So when we talk about a trig function, we're talking about the ratio, a specific ratio, of two of the three sides of a right triangle. And the units will always divide out. So a trig function is a unitless ratio that measures two of the three sides to each other. Now, of course, 6 tenths simplifies down to 3 fifths. So sine of C is equal to 3 fifths. All right, so now if we want cosine of B, B is now our reference angle. That's up here now. So now cosine is ka, it's adjacent over hypotenuse. Rut row, we have two angles that are adjacent, or two side lengths that are adjacent to B. But one of them is the what? The hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse never changes. So the hypotenuse is always going to be an adjacent side, but we don't call it the adjacent side. So when we do say adjacent, we really mean non-hypotenusal adjacent side, right? And if, I don't think there's a better adjective out there than non-hypotenuse. So I challenge you to use that again somewhere today in your, in your, in your life, non-hypotenuse. So that's going to be what? 6 over 10. And, of course, the units divide out, and we're left with 3 fifths. Holy moly, smokers. Turns out that sine of C is the same as cosine of B. Wow, that's pretty cool. Sin, of course, is short for sine. Cos is short for what? Cosine. So there's really one name there, right? Sine. We have sine and cosine. And maybe you've wondered why it's sine and cosine. Why do we reuse the same word and we just have a prefix of co? Let's talk about that a little bit. Angles B and C are related how? Don't say sisters. What? They are both acute, right? Yeah. Now, we missed compliment day. Today's opposite day. But if we were compliment day, since they're both acute, B might be like, yo, C, you look acute. And C be like, yeah, B, you look acute too. All right? And so if they're complimenting each other, then B, they would be insults today on opposite day. Very good. But B and C would be what? Complimentary. That's why compliment comes into it. If, if angle A is the 90-degree angle and the sum has to equal 180, then the sum of B and C has to equal 90. And two angles that add up to 90 degrees are what type of angles? Complementary. Now, that's complementary, not complementary, but it kind of sounds the same, right? So complementary. What are the two letters that complementary starts with? C-O, co. So sine of C is three-fifths and Cosine of the complement of C is also three fifths. Guess what the co and cosine stands for? Complementary. 
sine and cosine are complementary functions, which means the sine of one angle is equal to the complement of that function for the complement angle. That's why we use the word co. So we'll address that a little bit more moving forward. I'm just planting that seed right now, and y'all are like, wow. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, now, tangent of C, that's OA, 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 OA. So we find C, and OA is opposite, which is 6, over adjacent, which is 8, which simplifies to 3 fourths. Whew. Right. So those are the three main trig ratios, which we're going to call trig functions. So for any function, of course, we have an independent variable and a dependent variable. And as I mentioned yesterday, the angles themselves are your independent variable. C, B, and C in these three are your inputs, your X values, if you will, your independent variables. And it's the ratios themselves that depend upon the angles. So the ratios themselves are your Y values or your dependent variables, right? Independent variables are the angles. Dependent variables are the ratios. Now, what if I were to take this purple triangle and I were to multiply each side by two? That would give me a bigger triangle, right? And now this side would be 12, this side would be 20, and this side would be 16. Would those two triangles be related to each other, the purple and the red? Yes, we would call them what? They're similar triangles. Similar triangles have the exact same angles, but their side lengths are proportional. So they're increasing or decreasing by some scale factor all the way around. If I make the triangle bigger, let's see. What would the sine of C be now? Well, it would be 12 over 20, right? It would be opposite 12 over hypotenuse 20. What is 12, 20 simplified to? 3 fifths. Ah, we get the same ratio. What would the cosine of B be? Still 3 fifths, right? 16 over 20. I'm sorry, um, 12 over 20. And what would tangent of C be? It would still be 3 fourths. So that's what's cool about these trig functions or trig ratios. They are irrespective of the size of the triangle. What does irrespective mean? They don't, they don't respect it. No, not really. Irrespective means it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter what the size of the triangle is. It could be a big or a small, and as long as it's proportional, that scale factor will always divide out. And you're always going to end up with the exact same trig ratio uh, for that particular angle. That's pretty cool, okay? So that's kind of where we're moving forward today. We're going to look at sine, cosine, and tangent, but we're going to look at it in terms of x, y, and r. And we're going to meet three new dudes today, three more trig functions, okay? So let's, um, let's go ahead and define then, picking up where we left off yesterday, a trigonometric function. <clears throat> a trigonometric function, or for short, a trig function, because trigonometric is kind of, uh, kind of a lot to say, right? You start saying trigonometric and you got trigonometric, <sighs> trick. You have to pause almost halfway through because it's so long. So we just abbreviate it trig function. What is a trig function? Well, a trig function is nothing more than the ratio of two of the three sides of a right triangle that is formed by drawing a reference triangle whose reference angle is theta ref from an independent angle theta. So that's your input that's drawn in standard position. So what do we do? We start with uh, some angle. We rotate, we rotate, we rotate. We stop our independent choice, we drop a perp, creating a reference triangle, and now we have a triangle whose sides depended upon where we stopped. And if we then start taking the ratio of two of those sides to each other, we get a trig function, okay? So I want you to never forget to remember what a trig ratio or a trig function actually is. What is a trig function? Very simply, it is a ratio of two of the three sides of a right triangle. That's what you need to remember. And what are the units of these trig functions? Sure. 
Should we return to the warm-up? They are none, right? Because whatever the side lengths are measured in, when you take a ratio of two of them, the units divide out. So there are no units on a trig ratio, kind of like a radian. A radian is a ratio of two lengths. So is a trig ratio, a ratio of two lengths. The units are gone. All right. Um, let's go ahead and do example two before we scroll down to page two. It says, uh, draw a reference triangle in quadrant one. Drop your perp from a point X, Y on the terminal ray. Label the hypotenuse R, and then list all the possible ratios we can come up with in terms of X, Y, and R. All right. So here goes we. There's our Y axis. There's our X axis. Looking good. All right, so I'm going to draw a generic angle theta in quadrant one. Boom. There's my terminal ray, and there's angle theta. So I kind of mentioned this yesterday. We're going to pick an arbitrary point on the terminal ray. Don't draw it too close to the origin. Don't go too far out. Uh, I'm just going to choose this point right here as the arbitrary point on the terminal ray, x, y. So depending on how far I rotated, X might be bigger than Y, Y might be bigger than X. From there, I'm going to drop a perp straight down to the uh, X axis. And of course, you could snap to vertical if you want, creating a right angle. And now I've created a reference triangle. And unlike the warm up where the reference angle could change, as I mentioned yesterday, because we're on the coordinate plane now, our reference angle is always the central angle. Never, ever will it be the top angle, okay? So there's no doubt now to which angle we refer. Now, the coordinate x, y not only is a point in space, but uh, as we mentioned yesterday, it defines the lengths of two of the three sides. Uh, to get to the point x, y, you would go right x units and up y units. Now, if x, y happened to be in a different quadrant, x could be negative and y could be negative, and that's perfectly legal. You can have a negative X and a negative Y. The absolute value then of those numbers would end up giving you the width and the height, uh, X, Y, respectively, of that triangle. So X and Y, the ordered pair, very, very important. The ordered pair now is going to essentially give you the length, or the width, I should say, and the height of your reference triangle. Now the hypotenuse, uh, instead of calling it H, we're going to call it R. R for radius. As we saw yesterday, if you continue with that point on the terminal ray and you continue to rotate it all the way around, it would complete a circle whose radius is, in fact, R. So we're always going to call our hypotenuse because we're always going to configure it like this. We're going to call it R. It still is the hypotenuse, don't get me wrong, but we're going to call it R, the radius of rotation. So we got X, Y, and R. Okay, so now that we have this drawn, since a trig function is a ratio of two of three sides, let's go ahead in terms of X, Y, and R and start listing all the possible ways we could take two of these guys at a time. And I'll take, I'll take uh, suggestions from the studio audience. What? When you call him an idiot, it's opposite day. You mean genius, right? And when you say two and four, you mean... Well, it's got to be in terms of X, Y, and R. So if you have some kind of secret code for X, Y, and R as numerical values, I didn't get the decoder ring. Whoa! Okay, time out. You're throwing out the Pythagorean theorem. I don't want random knowledge. I'm looking for you to give me a ratio of... Hey, thank you! Y over X, right? How'd you get Y over X as a ratio of two sides? Well, I just chose Y. That's one of the sides. I chose X. That's another side. And the ratio is Y over X. Very good. That's what I'm looking for. All right? So I'm going to go ahead and list Y over X uh, down here. I'm just using the space, people. All right? So I'm going to write it right down there. You can write it wherever you want. All right. Uh, now that we've established what a ratio of two of three sides looks like in terms of X, Y, and R... Can anyone else give me another one, or is that the only one? R over X. Nice one. I'm going to write that one over here, just using the space, people. Sweet. 
we are cooking with oil now, as they say. Let's keep going. Are there, is there another one, or is that it? R over Y. Fantastico. I'm going to write that one right there. And that must be it, right? We got all of them with X, Y, and R. Oh, X over Y, right? Is X over Y different from Y over X? Is 5 over 1 different from 1 over 5? Heck yeah. So X over Y, I'll write that one right there. X over R. X over R, perfect. I'll write that one there. And, of course, now the cat's out of the bag, right? Why are you putting cats in bags to begin with? Y over R. We've got six listed so far. Are there any others? We can't do Y over Y because that's just one side. We have to choose two. I think this is kind of it, right? Let's say you have three people and you're trying to select them for three different offices. Call it president, vice president, and big nobody. Right? Yeah. So how many different ways can you choose the president from the three people? There are three different choices, right? But now that that choice is selected, how many different ways are there to choose the vice president? There's only two ways, which means now there's only one guy left for the big nobody role, and uh, there's only one way to choose that. So when you multiply independent events together, three times two times one, you get six. And so this tells you, this is the number of ways to arrange three different things, all right? And so we have all six of our ratios. Those are the only six ratios. So these right here, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, may introduce your six trig functions, right? Yay! Now, when we refer to them, we don't want to refer to them as like, hey, X over R, right? We certainly could, but we want to give them names. So back at the original convention where these ratios were found and discovered, um, they, they suggested names from the people in attendance. And so someone might have raised their hand and said, uh, how about Fred for that one, right? And then the two Freds in the audience went, no, 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 I don't want to. We don't need three Freds. There's already two of us. We don't want to call that guy Fred. But someone might say, hey, Fred, and we'll look, and that guy won't, right, maybe. So Fred was off the books. So then they kind of pondered, like, man, if, if only there were a sign from above as to how we could. And some people, I like that. I like that. So they wrote down the word sign, and someone was like, nah, we're not going to spell it S-I-G-N, right? We're parents of these guys. We're going to be very creative with how we spell names, right? Right? We're going to be very creative with how we spell common words like sign. So let's, let's just label or name that one. Sign, right? S-I-N-E. Ooh, right? Cool. And for some reason, it stuck. Now, of course, I wasn't at the meeting, and I've never read the transcript of the meeting, so I'm just making this stuff up. I don't know if they originally wanted to call that one Fred. But the name of sign stuck. And because it's a trig function, we abbreviate it S-I-N of theta. That's how we say it. We, we don't call it sin of theta. We still say the name sine of theta, like f of x. Theta is your independent variable, and your dependent variable is the ratio y to r, which measures the vertical to the hypotenuse. And then um, they came down to labeling x over r, and the guy was like, how about Fred again? He's like, no, we're going to run into the same problem. So we don't want to use Fred. And they're like, hmm, well... How about co-fred? That's different from Fred. They're like, no, that's, that's a little bit awkward, co-fred. But I like, I like your idea of, of, of saying co-fred, which is different from Fred. How about, since we already have sine, let's call it cosine. And it was like, okay, all right, I'm hungry. Let's go to lunch. And we abbreviate cosine, C-O-S of theta. And, of course, I made that up. I wasn't at the meeting. If you Google, how did they come up with the name of cosine, you're not going to see any story about cofred being brought to the table first and being rejected, okay? And then they came up with the ratio y to x, which is vertical to horizontal. And the guy goes, how about cocofred? They're like, ooh, cocofred. Hmm, like Coco Crisp? I like cocoa. That's chocolate. But, no, cocofred is kind of 
kind of awkward. Then how about co-cosine? We have sine, cosine, co-cosine, and then we can do like co-co-cosine. I see the pattern, right? And they're like, will someone remove this guy from the meeting? He's, he's, he's not really helping at all. So Philip was there. He's read the transcript. Someone said, I've got an idea. I was vacationing in England one time on the beach, and I fell asleep, and I woke up, and someone said, ah, there's a tangent. And then they called me tangent the rest of the time. So it's a good nickname. And they're like, okay, we'll go with it. <clears throat> All right. And, of course, we abbreviate tangent, T-A-N, of theta. Yeah, you nice person, you. You quick-witted person. All right. Tangent of theta, we abbreviate it T-A-N of theta, but we still read it as tangent of theta. Now, these are the three main guys that you learned in geometry. But now notice they're in terms of X, Y, and R instead of OA and H. Now, sine being Y over R is still opposite over hypotenuse, right? The opposite is Y always, and the hypotenuse is R always. So you need to commit these to memory in terms of X, Y, and R rather than saying it's opposite over hypotenuse, opposite is Y, hypotenuse is R. Kind of just re-memorize it in terms of X, Y, and R. Sine is Y over R, cosine is X over R, tangent is Y over X. Sine measures effectively the overall height compared to the hypotenuse. Cosine measures the overall width compared to the hypotenuse. And tangent measures the height compared to the width. And then we've got the three new guys from today, right? Your calculator only has buttons for sine, cosine, and tangent. And there's a good reason for that. Because the other three guys are just the what's of the first three guys. Not inverses. Not opposites. Not cousins. Thank you. Thank you. I thought we were going to have to go back to uh, elementary school. Yeah. Y over R, R over Y. X over R, R over X. Y over X, X over Y. So that's why I wrote them like this. That's why I listed the ratios like this. We've got our three main dudes on the first column, sine, cosine, tangent. And then we have their reciprocals over here. So anything that you can express in terms of one of these reciprocals, you can express in terms of sine or cosine or tangent, which is why your calculator doesn't need uh, the three buttons for the other three. Now, maybe you know the names of the other ones. Maybe you don't. R over Y, the reciprocal of sine, is not cosine. Hmm, bummer. So at that convention, they didn't name the reciprocals by names of co. Co does not mean reciprocal, right? What does co mean? Complementary, right? Um, so they had to come up with new names for these guys here, and the Fred guy was already thrown out of the convention, so that wasn't uh, submitted anymore. Does anyone else have a kind of funny, creative uh, story as to how R over Y got his name, or uh, maybe a rejected story? His name was Rye. Okay, his name was Rye, and Rye said, I suggest we name this guy Rye after me, right? After I. Okay, and they said, that might be too easy for people to remember. This is going to be a math thing, after all. We want to confuse people. So we don't want to name it rye because people might just say oh rye is r over y and that, again we want to confuse people so let's reject that i helped you out there is that good all right so then someone just said how about cosecant they're like whoa that came out of left field cosecant i like it i like it i haven't heard that name since my great aunt edna named her dog cosecant Right. Again, I'm just, I wasn't there. So we call this one, R over Y, we call it co-secant. And the three-letter abbreviation for the function is C, S, C of theta. So when you see C, S, C of theta, you don't read it as c -c -c of theta. You still say co-secant of theta. 
cosecant of theta. All right, so now, like, well, if we already have a cosecant, we have a cosine and a sine. So if we already agreed to call this guy cosecant, then we should probably name something secant, right? And we're, we're at R over X. So that was given the name secant. And we abbreviate this one, like the Southeast Conference, SEC of theta. Now, when you see that, you don't say sex of theta. You say secant of theta. You don't say sec of theta either. A little too far with the C at the end. Sex, right? There is an X, right? It's R over X, but that's not sex. That's a different subject. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't there. Okay? But here's, here's what I do know. Here's what I do know now. Sine and cosine are complementary functions, right? Sine of an angle is equal to the cosine of the complement of the angle. Guess how secant and cosecant are related? There was a little bit of method to their madness. They're also complementary functions. So cosecant of an angle is going to end up being the secant of the complement of that angle. They're co-functions of each other. So now, I guess our last name for x over y is forced if we want to keep the pattern, right? Sine has his cosine complementary buddy. Secant has his cosecant complementary buddy. And right now, it's just tangent. I want a buddy. All right, so cotangent. So there's really only three names, right? Sine, secant, and tangent. And then you got the complements of those, cosine, cosecant, cotangent. And we, of course, abbreviate that one. Don't get sleepy on me. C-O-T of theta. Cot of theta. Which we don't say cot of theta. We still say cotangent of theta. Now, again, they did not pair up the names by reciprocals, but the way I listed them here, I did list them in reciprocal fashion, sine, cosine, tangent, and their respective reciprocals, cosecant, secant, cotangent. So you just have to remember that sine and cosine are not reciprocals of each other. Secant and cosecant are not reciprocals of each other. Tangent and cotangent are reciprocals of each other. Whoa. That's kind of weird. Yeah, it is kind of weird. Because tangent and cotangent are complements of each other. The tangent of an angle is the same as the cotangent of the complement of an angle. They just also happen to be reciprocals of each other. So you do need to remember now the definitions of all these in terms of X, Y, and R. And you also want to remember uh, the, the nature of how they're related to reciprocal wise. So cotangent and tangent are the only two that are reciprocals of each other. Here's a way to kind of help you remember, maybe, I don't know, no two cos are reciprocals of each other. Every co pairs up with a non-co. Every co pairs up with a non-co. So if you remember, tangent and cotangent happen to be reciprocals of each other, then the reciprocal of sine has to be, not cosine, cosecant. Well, I guess it could, could have been cosine, but it's not. All right, so every co pairs up with a non-co. Sine, cosecant, secant, cosine, tangent, cotangent. You just have to remember that pairing. Okay? So here are your six trig functions, which just represent the names of two of the three sides of a right triangle formed by your independent choice of theta. Okay? So good so far? you got to memorize these. If you're trying to practice by doing the worksheet before you memorize this, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. So don't do it. Memorize it. Flashcards, Quizlet, whatever. Um, memorize them. Okay, so here's the formal definition. Everything we've just done, but I gave it to you in a box. Some people like that. Now, because theta can be rotated around more than one rotation, remember terminal rays, that are coterminal with each other, have the same reference angle, which means they're also going to have the same reference triangle. But because we can rotate around and around and around and around, these trig functions are sometimes called circular trigonometric functions. Okay? All right, so now we're on example three. 
and I like these types of problems. This is Lincoln, and I call these two clues problems. Two clues problems. So you probably grew up watching Blue's Clues, right? <laughs> Blue's Clues, right? Blue Skidoo, we can too. Let's jump right into our iPad. Um, and Steve was the host for the most part until he went off to college, which meant drug rehab, I think. And it wasn't the same. I kind of quit watching after that. You know, you watch with your kids and then they grow out of it, but you're hooked, so you just find yourself watching it by yourself sometimes as a grown man. Yeah, and you're yelling at the TV. It's right there! Same thing with Dora. Dora had a hearing problem. <laughs> All right. So here's why it's a two's clues problem. We're going to be given two clues, and we've got to solve the mystery. Here's the first clue. If sine of theta is 5 over 6, clue number one, what does that mean? That means that for some angle theta, the ratio of the vertical y to the hypotenuse r is 5 over 6. So we are given, essentially, two of the three sides of a right triangle, yeah? Yeah. And we can find the third side pretty easily. How do we find the third side? If, if you have a right triangle and, you know, two of the three sides, you can find the third side by? Pythagorean. The Pythagorean theorem, which we sometimes just call the P theorem for short, as long as you don't get it confused with the other theorem that says if you drink a lot of coffee, you're going to have to use the bathroom. That's a different P theorem. The P theorem we're talking about is the Pythagorean theorem. So now that we know that we can find all three sides, we just need to figure out where the angle lives because there's four quadrants. So here is clue number two. It tells you that theta lives between 90 degrees and 180 degrees. Now this is a very, very important clue for two reasons. First of all, it tells you that you're going to live between 90 degrees and 180 degrees which means we're not going to be in radians, but rather degrees. So it defines the, the units, if you will, of measurement for angles. If that had said pi halves to pi, we would be working in radians. But it also tells you the quadrant in which theta lives, right? It has to live in quadrant two. Good. So now here's the instructions. With these two clues, we've got to play detective. We've got to find the simplified exact value of the other five trig functions. So I know the sine function, I gotta find cosine tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent of the same angle. Um, and then it says we're gonna find theta and theta ref with the calculator. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is put those two clues that you're given into a picture. All right, and start with the second clue actually. Theta lives between 90 and 180. So draw a generic angle theta that puts you into quadrant two. Don't draw it too close to the y-axis. Don't draw it too close to the x-axis because it's going to make it harder to label. So as long as you're in quadrant two, it's all good. Now pick an arbitrary point on the terminal ray and drop the perp to the x-axis and create yourself that reference triangle. All right, so now go to the first clue and label based on which trig function you're given two of the three sides. Sine is y over r. You'll memorize that soon if you don't already. Sine is y over r. So I'm going to label the y as 5 and the r as 6. And now I need to find the other side. Why do I need to find the other side? You may be like, why are we doing this? Well, here's what we need to do. If you want to kind of set up your um, answer, we're going to say sine of theta equals cosine of theta equals, tangent of theta equals. So if you want to get in the method of systematically um, putting everything down in the same fashion, even though we're given sine, I like to have a complete set. So I'm going to relist it. Sine, cosine, tangent, your SOHCAHTOA, and then make a new column for the reciprocals. Cosecant of theta, secant of theta, and cotangent of theta. If you list them like this each and every time, you are reinforcing, every time you write it down, the reciprocal nature. Here's another thing you could do. Before you actually write the ratios down, rut row, go ahead and write the definitions in terms of x, y, and r. Okay? And that will reinforce what we're doing. Oh, 
I lost it all. That's kind of cool. So sine of theta is y over r. Cosine of theta is x over r. Tangent of theta is y over x. Good. And then over here on the reciprocals, you got cosecant of theta is r over y. Secant of theta is r over x. And cotangent of theta is x over y. So when you do that, now you can list the actual ratios. And, you're, and, you're, and you're, you're helping yourself remember it. So you don't have to sit down and actually memorize it because you're kind of learning it in context. Now, of course, sine of theta was given. That's 5, 6. Which of the other 6, then, besides sine, do we pretty much get automatically without really breaking a sweat here? Cosecant, okay, because if sine is 5 over 6, cosecant is 6 over 5. So now notice the other four all have what in their definitions? What letter? They all have X, right? So that's why we need to find X. We need to find the X coordinate, which is going to be that. That's five and six. All right, so of course the Pythagorean theorem, let's go off to the side. Oh, you all already done it. X squared plus five squared equals six squared. So X squared equals 36 minus 25. So X squared equals 11. Now, when you take the square root of something, you better at least consider what? Positive or negative, right? Sometimes negatives aren't relevant, but in this case, it is relevant, right? X could be negative or positive because we're on the coordinate plane. Y could be positive or negative, depending on which quadrant we terminate it in. So here, though, is something about R that you might want to write down. R is always, always positive, okay? He's been through the Rachel's Challenge program already. R is always positive. It's the radius of rotation. So while R is always positive, X and Y could be both positive or negative, depending on the quadrant in which we live. So if you take the square root of this, you get X equals negative square root of 11, or X equals positive square root of 11. And since we're terminating in quadrant 2, which one do we want? The negative square root of 11. Now this right here is probably the most important thing that you can do on this two-sclues problem to help yourself get the right answer. It's the one thing a lot of students forget to consider. In geometry, you never had negative lengths, right? Because you're on the Euclidean plane. But these now are directed distances. They're vectors. They're not just scalar quantities. So the negative means we're going left, and then the, the, the magnitude is, is square root of 11. All right, so now that we have all three sides of the reference triangle, we essentially have all six trig functions, all six. We just need to list them in the right order. So two things about your radicals. First of all, number one, always simplify your radicals. Can the square root of 11 be simplified? No, it's a prime number. But if it were the square root of 36, you'd call it six, right? It's the perfect square. Or if it's like the square root of eight, if it's not a perfect square, but it has the perfect square factor, you want to reduce that or simplify it. We did it at the beginning of the year. So we're ready to go ahead and list. I'll mention the second thing about radicals here as we, as we go through. So listing all the others now, cosine is x over r, so that's going to be negative square root of 11 over 6. Tangent is y over x, which is 5 over the negative square root of 11. Now here's the other thing about radicals. When we do the unit circle, which is coming up, we're going to rationalize our denominators if they have a radical so that everything is uniform, namely a 2. So I want you to get in that practice. So if you see a radical in the denominator, go ahead and rationalize it. We did this at the beginning of the year. You don't need to multiply by negative square root of 11 over itself. Just the radical part that simplifies. So square root of 11 over square root of 11, you get negative 5 square root of 11 elevenths. And notice the negative <laughs> went from the denominator to the numerator. Is that an oops or is that an okay? That's an okay, right. If you have a negative ratio, the whole thing's negative. You can put the negative in the top, the bottom, or bring it out front. So there's the ratio. And now that you have these three, you have the option of either flipping those for the reciprocals or pulling them off the, unit, uh, the, the, the diagram. So secant is going to be r over x, which is 6 over the negative square root of 11, or negative 6 over the square root of 11. We need to rationalize that one now. You do not have to show me multiplying by square root of 11 over square root of 11. This is pre-AP after all, right? You can do it in your head. 
It's negative 6 square root of 11 over 11. And then cotangent is x over y. I would not recommend flipping negative 5 square root of 11, 11, because you've already rationalized that one. If you want to flip it, flip the unrationalized version. Or, better yet, just pull it off the triangle so that you can make a check to see if you got tangent right and reinforce the ratio. x over y is negative square root of 11 fifths. Negative square root of 11 fifths. And there you go. There's the simplified, rationalized, exact value of all six trig functions. And I know you've done this before because my daughter is doing it right now in geometry in Joseph's mother's class, right? We do homework every night like this. The only difference is you only did it for sine, cosine, and tangent. You're having to do it now for these three other dudes, which pretty much come for free, right? Come for free. It's like if you... If you call right now to get the bell and howl like insane LED light, you get a second one free, right? You just pay separate shipping and handling, right, right, right. You have these three, sine, cosine, tangent, and you get the other three for free. They come automatically. They're just reciprocal. All right, now we're not done. we got five minutes. There's a follow-up to this. I now want to figure out what theta is. I want to know what the angle is. We've got to use the calculator. We essentially set up six equations with theta in it that we can solve. See you, Destiny. Six different equations that we can solve. Now, because your calculator only has sine, cosine, and tangent buttons on it, I would recommend you choose one of the sine, cosine, or tangent equations. You can certainly do it with the other one, but we'll do that later. Now, of the three equations, sine, cosine, tangent, cosine and tangent have radicals in them, so you may shy away from those and gravitate towards sine, but the real reason you want to use the sine ratio is not necessarily because it has the prettiest numbers, but because what? It was given to you, so you know it's what? You know it's correct. If you had made a careless mistake on one of the other ratios, like even just forgetting to call it negative, you're going to get the wrong answer. So it's good practice to use the one that's given. So let's go ahead and do that. If I choose that ratio, sine of theta equals 5, 6. I want to now solve this equation for theta. Do I do it by dividing through by sine? Does that work? Divide by sin? What happens if you divide by sin? You sin. Good. You sin. So that doesn't work. That does not work. So how do you undo taking the sine of something? Oh, it went black again. I lost it. There we are in vacation. The way you undo taking the sine of something is you take the inverse sine of something. Yeah, sine of theta is 5, 6. So we call this right here the inverse sine. It's kind of a generic name, right? But it says exactly what it does. It undoes the sine. So that doesn't mean the reciprocal of sine. That means the inverse of sine. Remember when we studied inverse, we used f to the negative first to denote inverse? Same thing here. Now, the inverse key is found on the sine key. You just hit second sine. So I'm going to show you what we're doing here. We're actually taking the inverse sine of both sides. And when you do that, it has to be on the left because you're not multiplying. Now, the inverse sine of sine of theta is just theta, right? When you compose two functions back to back, you get what you started with. At the very least, when you do this for real, for me, you have to show that line right there. That's solve for theta, and it tells me which ratio you're using. And now you go to the calculator. If you're ever hitting the sine, cosine, or tangent button, you better be in the right mode. Anytime you hit the sine, cosine, or tangent button, you better be in the right mode. Default is radian. We need to be in degree, don't we? So you've got to switch it to degree. Anytime you hit the sine, cosine, or tangent button, you need to check your mode. So now that I know I'm in the right mode, now we'll go back to the home screen, and you hit second sine of 5 divided by 6. And when you write that down, you get theta equals 56.442 degrees. And is that the answer? In geometry, it was always your answer because you were dealing with triangles, and you were finding angles inside triangles that they all had to add up to 180. All of your answers were always correct. But where does our angle live? It lives in quadrant two, between 90 and 180. 
It's 56.442 degrees in quadrant two? No. No. Uh-oh. So it gave us the wrong answer. So if you typed it in again, and this time before you hit enter, you go, give me the right answer. And you hit enter. Guess what? It's going to give you 56.442. If you take your calculator back to Walmart and say, it's broken, and they give you a new one, and you put it in degree mode and type inverse sine of 5.6 on your new calculator, guess what it's going to give you? Same thing. You may just add 90 to it. You may just divide it by 2 or square it. We're going to figure out tomorrow why your calculator is giving you the wrong answer and how you can use that number to find the one you want. And that's why it's called two clues. We have to solve the mystery. And we have to go like through the forest, over the bridge, and through the castle. Lo hacimos. Tomorrow, lo hacimos. All right. Um, don't forget to turn in your calculator.